That's me, a uh, very long name, but uh, shortened form is AMBI, A-M-B-I. Um, before I came to Australia, I was in Ireland, and I taught there for about 18 years there, and the class size was maximum 50. And there was no problem as such. Every student was entitled for grants, so they get daily expenses. So um, contact hours were roughly about 28 hours per week. So they're all in the class. So attendance wasn't the problem. So they had, they had to study. If they didn't study, naturally, a small majority will fail. Most of the time, they are committed small class. So when I came here in 1999, our head of school, Bank of Seller, said, would you like to teach a large class? I said, OK. So within the seven weeks I arrived here, I was happy to teach. So I went into a large class. Large class means that was 450 students between Compension, Elec Engine, Telecom Engine sitting there. And I'm in front of them, first time ever trying to teach. And oh, it was a big task. <laughs> first thing is class control. Second one is trying to get, what you are, get them to understand what you are teaching. And at the end of the class, have you actually achieved what you want, what you want to really teach in that class, the learning outcome? So it was a very, very difficult task. Then I spoke to a lot of other staff and say how you do them. And, Everybody has different ways, and, uh, and um, having said that, and I have taught many, many classes since then, and what I'm going to report is uh, what I've done for one particular class, which is a third year course, is a signal processing course, which is a mathematically oriented course. And there is a follow-on course, an elective course in the fourth year, so they need to really have the fundamental achieved in the third year in order to do the follow-on course. And the follow-on course will tell you roughly whether, if you teach in the follow-on course, you'll know whether they've actually understood the third year course. I did teach the follow-on course, but then somebody else is teaching, and they're giving me feedback. So I always adjust my course accordingly. So I'm just going to go through what I have done in these projects. And two projects I have done uh, over, over nearly four years. And uh, I've accumulated results, but I'm going to only present some of the results because I won't have all the time. So basically. Uh, I'm just going to share my experience with you, and one is technology-assisted learning, and the other one is uh, basically project-based learning. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on project-based learning, but I'll go through the technology-assisted learning um, first. So this is the problem I see with the students. Most of the students suffer some degree of difficulty in the large class. So what sort of difficulties? And there are other difficulties, but I find Maintaining student at, uh, attention span is a problem. And they can, you could keep them for 20 minutes, non-talking, listening, and then they lose interest. You're going to change your activity in a large class. Now, large class now, I'm going to report, is about 120 students, because signal processing is taken by, um, in two sessions, therefore we divide them into 150 is the maximum you'll have. That's what the large class in this case is. And the difficulty for catering individual students' need because you are explaining a concept and somebody puts a hand and the student is asking a very basic question and you're trying to cater for him. It's a problem within the time, you see. And then you've got a different pace of learning and then lack of fluency. In, and that's the students coming from uh, different countries sometimes. They've got the English bar when they try to do, ask you a question, sometimes it's difficult and they find it difficult to explain in the class. These all are causing problems to have a real interaction with them in the class. Loose of continuity due to missed classes. So what happened in signal processing, if you miss two classes, and the two chapters are important for the third chapter, you're going to struggle in the third chapter. So how do you catch up all sort of things? You could have all sort of assessment and everything, but you've got problems. Then it's the mathematical concepts, and that's the main problem. You know, you've got to have understanding. You need to concentrate in the class in order to get that. And one of the main things I have is that if they miss a critical steps, and is they, because I'm explaining something and they missed it, they didn't catch it in the class, the ways of getting it back is either they come and ask me or they look at a book, or ask a friend, but there's no way of revisiting what I said in the class. They haven't got anything. See, so there are students who find it difficult. And sometimes it's very difficult to get the explanation that I have given because the explanation I was given, I, I gave, is based on a question prompted in a class by another student. So it was an unexpected explanation for a question. Now, you need to capture that for a student if they want to revisit. There's no, no other facilities in a, in a real environment. And, uh, and some people need to revisit some part of lectures I have done. So I'm coming back 
my life lecture, what I give in a lecture theater, I mean, I'm, I'm rated by the students, a fantastic lecturer. But I like to see that lecture being captured for students for revisiting them at time to solve some of these problems. And that's what my thinking is. And I just go through how I've done this. So my view is that we should have live lectures back to them available. Uh, I'm not looking at I lecture, I'm not looking at Lectopia at the moment, but I'll come back to that later on. And so that they can actually look at the lecture outside the class and to encourage them independent learning and time spent after study class. So they are the two aspects I thought over years, and I need to provide this some more how. So first funding I got from, um, from the faculty when Tim Hesketh was the associate dean at the time back in 2001 to develop for my course Java-based applets. It's just the animations and have your lecture notes all set up so students can study independently, online material before Vista came and everything. So I, I'll just show you one demo. My demonstration will be very small ones and I'll just show you. I got to move on. Just give me one second, please. So here is one. I, I don't use them anymore because I've developed further thing. This, all my lecture notes is in a, in, a, in a particular format. The way it is is, for example, if I click on this uh, chapter, I want this to be a lecture notes a student to read. And we've got examples and questions, but I want them to read this lecture and look at an answer, quick answer for that. If you put the thing, then it gives you the answer. And then, um, sorry, I want to select a design course. Here's a lecture. Here's a design where I want them to understand this le lecture, and then they select the number of polls. But then these are all simulation done using Java applets. And then they cancel polls here. Those who have done engineering would know, and then look at the response. As they start to cancel every one of them, sorry, this one, they'll get that. So they need to think about it, what is happening. So this is the concept I'm, I'm doing it at that. So this is the principle, but this is not the analytical skill they will get from here, just the principle behind it. So similarly, I've got lots and lots of applets. You can go for oscillators and various things, and you can look at examples. And so the way we designed it, this part is lecture notes, this part is real-time simulation, and this part is a small question. And after I finished this, and this was a supporting material after I've given the live lecture, but only so much you can do with this. And um, so students' comments, I just move out of that. Students' comments were, oh, oh, really great. These ones are good. I got a lot of emails saying that. But OK, you feel good when they send you email. But then when you assess them and we look at their paper, exam paper, there's, there's not a lot there. So. It, didn't correlate for me, as far as I'm concerned, honestly. I mean, the analytical skill that they should have in the third year in that assessment wasn't there. Oh. So I felt it's, you know, it wasn't really doing. So, and then I just, the other advantage, I didn't, I didn't move uh, too much further on that because you're going to develop more applets, keep developing. That means you need to have some technical support and you need to have funding from faculty continuously. You know? So I moved away from that because of the cost and various things, even though that is still valuable to students. Then in year 2004, Branko Seller got a funding. He was a head of uh, school at the time. He got funding from, from the state. And also, he was setting up a virtual classroom. And then we have got another technical support person, Dr. Ming Sheng, who did the software and everything. So I was the person who was ap applying this. So I wanted to use the electronic whiteboard that we set up in our room for interactive tutorials with the students. So I had a tutorial class of 30 students in that room. And I'll ask the students, you must come prepared, and you'll be asked to do the work on the board. So they got to do, uh, do it on the board. And then this electronic whiteboard would have, basically, what you have would be is a blank sheet you can open up. And you write, the students write the questions and answers. And you can build up many, many sheets like that. Throughout the class sheet, various, various students doing this. And at the end of the class, and what you do is you kind of accumulate all the sheets and then send it to them by email. So it's students' work, like basically. These are all students' work, their handwriting, or I, my handwriting, with the, their work and their explanation. All these are. So they get an email back from me, all their work that, for that tutorial. 
it's a pretty good way of doing it. And you can get the students to en engage with you, and they get all what they have written and everything. This is, I wrote the question. Here's a student came and wrote the transformation, and I wrote the answer at the end. Well, he, he has already got it, but I just, so similarly, various, various questions. Here's a question on the spot, I did it, and here's a student doing the question. And I got that interaction going, and it was pretty good, but you know, there's a limitation on it, how much can you do? Now, what are the problems you have on that is basically, uh, go to the next slide. So the attention span of participation was high, and I was, I was really pleased to see that was very, very high. Most students prepared for electronic whiteboard tutorial <coughs> class, but the disadvantage, some students were shy. You can't force them, you must do, you can't force them. Even though they were prepared, I could sit down next to them, they have them prepared, but they don't want to go to the board. So it didn't really, I mean, you can't use it all the time, and it's a very valuable tool. So next thing I said, okay, let me try another one in 2005, and I got further funding as well. So in 2005, I said, I want to, this is a tablet PC, and you can use a tablet pen, and you can do all sorts of things with those, and then you can record them. So what I wanted to give is, if you look at this as a question, here's a question. Students do the question, and this is the answer I will provide them with the explanation on the board. And I said, if I can capture this somehow, it might be very useful for the students. So I, I dev um, Ming Sheng developed a software. You've got to switch between the. So here is the solution I gave. 10 seconds. Another 10 seconds, 5 seconds. Okay. All right, let me stop this one. I mean, it's going on for another 10, 20 seconds. So I just then created this one single file and then emailed to the students. And I just, so this gives you explanation <coughs> rather than giving a static solution. So if you are doing mathematics or something, instead of giving a static solution, you could add on some explanation to it. So which is very valuable to students. Because that's what, in maths, they have problem. In signal processing, they have problem. If I give static solution, how did he get this step? Where, why did he put initial condition zero? Why did he do this? Where if you get this one, you got the static as well as an explanation. OK, so then in 2006, well, what was the problem here? Yeah, it's time consuming. You're going to produce this one for every question. So it was time consuming for me to do this one. So it wasn't, it wasn't easy, but then Ming Sheng and uh, Brad Costello wanted to produce something different, and Ming Sheng was producing new software, so we came up with another solution, which is the solution we are using it now. So let me explain that next one is. In 2006, that I said my, all my lectures, I just want them, to, want them to be, there are seven chapters in my lecture, and we produce full lectures completely recorded using this electro, electric, um, uh, electronic whiteboard technology. So they get a lecture. I'll show you an example of, like, they got a one lecture notes and 10 CDs, or eight CDs, depends on the chapters. Every chapter is in there. And why did I do that? I'll like, come back to you, the reasons I gave you as well. And how do I assess the exam? Like they've got a final exam of 50%, laboratory 10, web CT quiz, I've got 200, 300 quizzes, multiple choice questions. And then they've got a class exam, also, and uh, I will now have to move out of this and show you what I have developed. This guy, just give me a second. So here is one of the, one of the chapters, just show you a, a clip of one chapter.
So this is how students can play this on their own computer using the full. Okay, we now come to the chapter six, which is the multi-signal oh. signal processing chapter. So now in this chapter, what are the they can move do? like this? Okay. That's something which is here. You know, not something which is at the moment. And I want to see an output here. The output here is this over so, Different sampling, and this is in. So what's the advantage here? Is your live lecture, what you do in the lecture theater, is recorded in a different way. I have a different lecture theater. Everything you explain in a class is captured electronically. So three streams, audio is separate, and your video is separate, and electronic whiteboard is separate. And what the student needs is, I mean, it's like if a student is reading a book, sometimes they don't understand. They don't have explanation. If you think of a book with an explanation like this, it makes a big difference. So this is one of the examples of the lecture. So you're going to convert your lecture notes into PowerPoint, but it's not a PowerPoint as a point. It's purely a lecture like you have. And the students will like move through. They don't need to go through every section. Depends on the student. They will move through a se small section here. Like, for example, I just move in somewhere faster here. For, for, to explain a waveform. So to explain a process or a waveform is not easy in a book. And where this explains with actual, if you are a good lecturer, if you can present things well, this is a very good way of pro providing the lecture notes. One ex another example I show you here is, I was asked to give another course with, with a, only a month notice, and so I didn't have PowerPoint presentation at all. So what I did is I wrote the lecture notes by hand, and use this technology. So you can do it instantly. You don't need PowerPoint. If you can write them very well. And Y. And start from here. And it just goes like that. If you can see here, when you give this one. So I'm just changing. One more example on that is that one of the quiz I gave, the students had problems with the solution, the static solution. They were not happy with that. So I provided dynamic solutions for all these uh, quizzes. Uh, uh, quiz, uh, which was held on the 18th of April. Such a so I gave the same thing, you know? 625 T plus pi over pi. That's the correct answer. The reason I gave you the sampling. So just coming back to this. So all, all what you do in the class can be captured and give to the student is, is a one good idea. But I come to you now and I explain to you one of some of the results I've got now. Just let me move on. The other thing is this CD is uh, the lectures on here. There's an expiry date on this, and students don't know them. So when they get them, after they finish the course, it's not <coughs> useful to them at all. It's automatically self-destructing. So there's nothing they don't know. So if they, they'll try them afterwards, and they say if it doesn't work, they'll look for another copy. So that's done by the software. I Ming mean, Sheng did the software. So that's the protection. Now we have used this CD for so long. Now we're going to re-record other things. So we have put everything now on our website. We have streamed our lectures now. So if you go to a school website, you have, in this particular course, uh, I won't play everything, but i just show it to you. Oh, it's not moving. Oh, here you go. I've got all the chapters, one, two, three, four, five, six, all of them. Anybody can look at them at the moment. So the students can be in any computer, look at them. Before, they have to put their CD in and, and listen to them with their uh, headphones. Now they can just stream the lectures. So that facility is provided. And this one is just a lecture I gave from Ireland many years ago. And the lecture was recorded at UNSW. I, gave, I taught a class of 30 students, postgraduate students, giving the lecture from Ireland using this technology. And these lectures were recorded at this end and was given to the students at this end, live recording. Anyway, OK, let's move on next one. So what are the advantages? Let's look at this, and then I give you some sort of a so students can watch them at their own convenience. Uh, sorry, uh, this is one of the things you will have always with the, if you're using tablet PC. They can watch them at their convenience. They can take a break. 
So if a student missed my class for some reason, he has got supporting material. I'm not saying we've got to, live lecture has to be given, otherwise it's not, it doesn't work. Live lecture with the supporting material is what the answer I'm saying. Repeat section they want, skip section they don't want, and then be familiar with the lecture's accent, which Matthew, um, Philip was talking about. Prepare specific questions for discussion class. Some people, some of the students, in the students I divide my group into three categories in my mind. One is the top student, 30%. You can do anything you want. You don't need a lecture note. You can speak to them, they'll be fine. <coughs> next one needs lecture note. The next one, the weaker students. And you can give them every material, but they don't have time to look at them, right? So the challenge is to how to bring these weaker students upwards and how to excel the good students further is the challenge really. So I did this uh, DVD-based one in 2006, and I had three surveys, progressive surveys. I want them to, I don't want to do one survey to find out what answer. I want them to tell me week four, what's, how are they looking at this, week nine, week, and if you look at all the questions I have asked, there are many questions and many other results even after that. I didn't present it. I just want to give you one. You can see about 20% of the students were not really happy uh, that, uh, that uh, if you don't give the life lecture, if you only rely on that, 20% are not happy. But as I, time went along, when they got used to various, various things, now if I do this survey again, it's like something like about 10% are like still saying, Ah, uh, we don't use, to, use the DVD. They are good, but we don't use them. I don't know the reason. But if I can achieve 90% happy, I'm very happy with that, okay? So it is, this is developed for large class or small class material. I have developed for postgraduate course. So live lecture followed by supporting material. I just give you one interesting reason. I'm not worried about the exam results. Normally I give a good lecture and they do well, but I just had a problem always. In a traditional lecture, when I have an exam in week nine, here, if you look at here, failure rate is like 45%, like in a class exam of uh, one hour. Why? They have missed a few classes, or they have no way of revisiting, and this trend increases. Since I increased the DVD-based one, I've increased a lot of students are actually visiting. Because they have exam, they know they're going to watch the lectures if they don't. So I'm getting them to study. And that's one of the problems which I'll show you in our analysis we have done. That's the question I ask you. Do you know that how many hours they study? I have answer that they have given me. That survey is done over five years. I'll give you the results in a second. So exam results, like in a normal tradition, 80% is what I normally get passed in there. No matter what you do, you're the wonderful lecturer, they say, but I can't get anything more than 80 in a large class. No matter, because they don't study, that's the reason. But I am achieving more than that now, and with actually good knowledge, they're getting able to do analytical skills well. I can see the exam papers, and I'm seeing that. So major benefits in the conclusion why students have control over how they learn. We can non-speaking students can adapt, and students are very positive about it. Improvement in students' analytical skills, I have observed them after I supply the DVD. I have observed them in, in the exam paper. They are able to do compared to when I do one-to-one. -one. So the next part is, this is just uh, technology-assisted learning. Next one is the project-based learning one. I'll make it simpler. The school has done a survey over many years, 2003 to 2006. We have got about 40 questions, the school does it, and, and all the results goes to the head of school to look at them and also director of academic studies as well. The students have to answer, students have been told in the class, please don't give a wrong answer. If you don't want to answer questions, it's fine. You will find 75% of our students study less than 10 hours per week and 35% studies less than five hours per week. So the university is expecting them to study around 20 because our engineering courses are 20 contact hours. They expect them to study another 20 hours. So if 35% are only doing five hours per week, let's say five hours, they're not, this is for all subjects, not my subject alone. So they haven't done 15 hours of study per week, right? And if you multiply by 12 weeks, you can't make up that before the exam. So you got to, if you really want them to really, this is a problem, in our, well, in our school this survey was done, so I don't know, it's over many years. 
And so there's a real need to encourage students to study. There are two aspects now. One aspect is university saying, look, give them online material, give them everything, everything, everything. Here's the funding, funding, funding. But on the other hand, they are not studying. What are we doing about it? That's where the major problem. I know it's responsibility on them, but they are not studying. So if you look at a survey here, this was done in 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006. Time spent after, time spent on study after class. About 35% of the students are studying less than five hours. This is, they did this one. I mean, they gave this answer. We didn't collect it from that. And then if you look at the part time, and 50% of the students doing, 40% of the students doing part-time hours. Like, so here, look, the part-time is somewhere there, like on average. So they're going for part-time job, and during the class, some of them are going. So what do we do? So I changed my course on my course. I said, no, no, I need to go. So I, I can see, I've given every support. I'm only getting about 80% pass rate. I'm not getting anything. They're not going to pass anything more than that unless they reach the level. I mean, the level is set. You must have this level before you go to the fourth year to pick up the course. And I'm not going to compromise. But I got to assist them. I got to help them a bit more. That's my view is because they're not studying. In Ireland, I don't need to do that because they are there for studying. They have got funding. But here is not the case. So, so what I did is project-based learning. I gave both live lectures and pre recorded DVDs. And entire course was revised and I revisited them and made, made up course as a single large problem. And they got to solve the problem as a group and then individually presenting it. And they got to come up with a solution. So this course is now. What I suggested, I got to compromise to make them. So I said to them, this is the way it works. Session one, week six, they've got a 20% class exam to test the analytical skills. Session two, week level, sorry, session one again. Test two, again, these two exams test the analytical skills. One and a half hours exam, you can, you can believe that. Three hour exam, they're getting it. Ongoing lab, this is where they're doing, learning the problem based learning about 40%. They're going to go to lab presentation. After everything is finished in week 12, they're going to present in front of the tutors. Right. And lab quizzes, which I always have them, no final exam. You can't do that for all the subjects. If you do all no final exam, then everything collapses. So I selected, I'm director of academic studies, so I knew what subject they're taking. So I choose my subject, no final exam. So students are going to study from week one to week 14, they're week 12 or week 14, they're going to study. And I said, there are two problems I'll explain to you in a second, the next diagram. And when I did that, I, did, I have done this project in session one, 2007, and session 2008. And if you look at, if you draw the line here, only that percent are happy. Something like 60% are happy with this. These students are unsure, and, and in 2008 it's getting better and better, now they're getting used to it. So when you in, ask the student, they said, this is the first course we are doing project-based learning. We have never got used to it. So we are going to look for material. You look at your, we are going to watch your DVD. We are going to go and look for material, and it takes a lot of time. Does it take more than five hours? I give five hour contact for them, like labs and tutorial. Does it take more than five hours? No. So naturally, they're not putting their five hours. They're finding it difficult to put the five hours. So if you go further, here's some of the exams. They're very interesting results I have. I have two more slides and finished. These two are project-based learning. And I did not make these analytical exam as compulsory for them to pass. I said if you have done, if you, you can see only 54% actually pass the compulsory project-based learning class exam. They all spend a lot of time on, on the actual finding the solution for the problem. So through that, 90% pass the exam. And this year 2008, I said, you, in order to pass the course, you must pass this analytical skill exam. So they put their time, and they pass, and 90% passed. And the reason you get 95 is there were about eight students on 48 marks. I gave them another exam, because they're just borderline. They've done so well in the labs and everything, because their analytical skills are, they're going to pick up the analytical skills from first year, <coughs> second year. If they don't pick up, they're not going to pick it up in third year, but I've got to give them an opportunity. 
And not only that, can I, didn't I say to you before, these are traditional lecture way. When I give traditional lectures in week nine, if I give an exam, it's no good at all. After I've started DVD based, you can see the pass rate is always pretty good, very early stage. Now what I'm doing is that bit more I'm doing it because I want to know have I actually given the knowledge that they need for the follow on course. So what am I doing? I'm looking, I'm trying to, yeah, okay, just the evaluation on this course, I certainly see them that uh, they, they have understood the theory very well, but problem-based learning, a previous, uh, Sam, um, uh, uh, Sami has also explained, it has a lot of overhead. I got to get the tutor to train because they have got to be evaluated. All tutors have to be trained, so they have got the same roughly knowledge because otherwise uh, students will start to switch around tutors if they're giving more money. So all sorts of problems there, but it's okay, it's doable. So what currently I'm doing is this. This is a follow-on course in the fourth year, which is an elective course. 2006, I introduced the DVD base. So students are getting better in the course, in my course, and more students are doing the follow-on course. You can see that. Now, I looked at this cohort of students, and that cohort of students have got two types. One group did the problem-based learning in the third year. Another group have done the normal non-problem-based learning. I got two groups in that particular cohort. So I looked at the exam result just like last week. 25 students uh, did the problem-based learning. Only five of them failed. Fa their failure is only 48, 49. These are not. And these guys who did the non-problem-based learning, uh, about seven of them failed out of 19. And I, I also believe that results because the guys who have done the problem-based learning through the course, my course, have got a more, better understanding through the problem, pro, through the DVD. Others have less understanding, I, I certainly think that. But in order to conclude this, you're gonna do a few more years of this before. So what I do when I run my lecture, first session is problem-based, second session is non-problem-based. And that's how I'm running it at the moment. So this just, some of my experience of what I've done, and, and uh, you know, I thought I'd just give it here. Question and answer time. Any questions? Andy, a quick question in relationship to setting up your, your visual based learning, which is actually having the video, your lecture notes, and then having it all put together. What's the sort of time investment that came into that? But as I said, when I got the faculty funding, I gave my lecture notes to a student, I employed a student for three months to convert my lecture notes in a PowerPoint, even though I was doing it in parallel. So I got it converted in PowerPoint. Once you are converted in a PowerPoint, you go into the, uh, this lecture room set up by Branko Seller and Ming Cheng, go there, and you're on your own, the software is all set up. You just press a button, you do deliver a lecture without the students. You don't stop it for 10 minutes, go for coffee, come back and redo it. Once you are recorded once, that's it for three, four years. So initial time that you put in for recording this CD, this CD has been now, been, we are giving them 2001, 2006, 7, 8 now, for three years, I haven't changed it at all. Same course content. So initially there's a, um, a cost involved in the census. But if you decide, no, no, I don't want any PowerPoint, just handwritten, write them though, I have done it, handwritten one, and then you do the recording. So what do you do in the lectures, in the actual physical face-to-face -face lectures? In the lecture, I just go through this lecture Sense. notes. I go through page by page, which is already there. But I make it interactive, more interactive now. So I get one of the students to come to the board to do the question. Because I have enough time now, because they can watch the DVD. So I make the lecture so interactive at the moment. And one of you would ask, if you are giving all this material, other, what about the student attendance? I still have a very good attendance. Because the question I do in the lecture is slightly different. Because the student asking me a question, I change them around. And I'm not worried about, I'm going to lose the time, no. And I suddenly tell them, okay, we've done this, you can watch the DVD. It's, life, it's basically a virtual classroom. If you look at this, just basically what I do in the class is what's here. And the students tell me, I have lots and lots of questions and lots of, they tell me, there's no difference between this and your life lecture. Only thing is life lecture, you ask interactive. There's no interaction when you give this one. You're only watching, that's the only thing. So, Can I just clarify, in the problem-based component, yeah. is it a single problem as such that they work on over the whole course? 
like is semi described in here? Yeah, so? it's a single problem. It's a, in, 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 in signal processing, we say, and a, and a problem of modulation or something, single problem, but there's eight parts to it, so six parts to it. So the first week, they'll work on the first part. Second week, third week, fourth week, and fifth week, yeah. F fifth week, they should have finished, and this, well, not fifth week, like uh, 11th week. And 12th week, they've got to give a presentation individually to the tutors on the overall problem. Uh, the reason I ask is, I mean, certainly one of the problems that has arisen with right. this approach in, in medicine right. has been the expectation that students would develop generic skills in yeah. solving a problem which would be transferable, yeah. and it doesn't happen. Um, yeah, that's yeah. certainly been the issue of medicine. It's been yeah. found that they, they don't transfer generic skills from dealing with one problem to another one. When they face with a new problem, they, they, they don't. In medicine, they, yeah. I don't see. I, I, I find that this is, I mean, that's how I'm looking at it, like, you know, how they're dealing in the follow-on courses as well. And, and they are, I, it's very popular among even the tutors themselves, the same tutors I've been using for them, that they see there's a big difference in students' understanding and explanation on the theory, which they did not see before. And also, when I see the analytical, when I correct the papers, I correct the papers, analytical, and I see a big difference on the answering. I say, my goodness. So, because I don't know, I'm making them to study. That's what they're saying. They're saying it's hard to adjust to, but it's fantastic relief at week 12. So, I'm just giving my experience. I, there may be questions I don't know the answer, but we're still trialing out. Well, can I ask you one yeah. question? Yeah. Yeah. You know how you eventually turned away from having a final exam and having them actually assessed during the session? Yeah. Um, did the students sort of say that they have enough time to actually prepare for the exam? Yeah, the reason was that they were saying is that because, for the, because it was a problem based, they got to prepare for the lab for that problem. That problem is related to the chapters as well. And they come into the tutorial class regularly. They've got assessment continuously. They've got to have web CT quiz. So basically, I'm forcing them to study the five hours they're supposed to study. That's all I'm expecting. I'm not expecting anything extra from them. I'm telling them I'm giving five hours contact. You do five hours, you should be fine. That's what I'm doing. Those who want to do very, very well, extremely well, I'm sure put more hours in reading books and things like that. But, and also, I've got other surveys. I mean. Our students, uh, only 10% of our students use textbooks for reading. If 10% are reading textbooks, well, which is in, in line with our high distinction as well. <laughs> but uh, but, but uh, where are they going to get it? So I'm forcing them. This problem-based learning, you got to, the tutors won't give them any help. They'll explain. They've got to find the problem. They can't find it from another student because they've got to translate them in the lab when they assess. Every week they've been assessed. Every two weeks they're assessed, individually assessed. They can work in a group outside, but when they're assessed individually. So it's not a, sorry. So do they all have the same problem? Is there one problem that everyone has? Um, yeah, but there's multiple solutions to it. So they've got five solutions. They can pick and choose the solution. And within the, the way signal processing, within, if they do the same solution, we can actually find out whether they have understood by asking various changes on the, on the problems. Okay. I guess my, I, I was yeah. leaning towards yeah. you know, how do you know that student has yeah. actually done the work and not just... Yeah, no, no, they're individually assessed. And eventually they're going to do the presentation. If they don't pass the presentation, they don't pass the course. And I give them another chance to prepare, well prepare and come. Now, there's so many you know, barriers there to jump, you know, they can't. Basically, I want them to study the stipulated five hours, and this is the way I found it. I can't other way. What percentage of your students actually don't pass medical degree 12? You know, in other words, when you actually do them a retest? Uh, uh, the, about 5%. Five percent. Uh, that's what I'm saying. With this problem-based, mm -hmm. I'm really doing well. With the non-problem-based, traditional lecture, like final exam, if I rely on it, like about 82, 82%, 85%. All of them still say, you're a good lecturer, but you don't translate them the paper for me. Like, I, I, no good. So this is making them to study, basically. That's, that's it, actually. And then, like, there are things you're going to give. I mean, I, I agree with the feedback, and they get, you know, for my Web City quiz, they get instant feedback. After first 20 minutes in the lab, uh, we give them the results and everything. 
Uh, last session I did something, and I used to do them before, but I didn't have time. I had 120 students. I saw every student after the first exam. I went through their paper, and it's crazy, one full week. Mm -hmm. and, and everybody was offered out of 100, 112 students, only 82 students came. Others didn't come, so I didn't chase them. But, but uh, and that's one of the things they thought is fantastic and positive about it, that they said, I went through for everybody who got 90 or so, even everybody, and I told them what, what went wrong. But I'm not saying everybody has to do, but then and there, those sort of things are very important. The feedback, if you want to give, you want to give real feedback on the assessment paper, and they appreciate so well. You tell them. They could even come into your office and say, look, I haven't done the paper. No, don't worry about it. Let's go to check section by section. Do you see here's the weakness you have? Here's the thing, this. It's just, just a help, anyway. So basically, that's, that's my you know, talk. But I got lots of results. I do every year, every session. I only showed you some of those. And I didn't want to show everything good, so I had something not good also there. So if you need to discuss anything, or if you are interested or anything, I'm very happy to talk to you on this one. That is what we'd like to do now. Thank you. Oh.